Hi everyone, uh, this is lecture three for POS 201, Introduction to Political Theory. And uh, today we delve into the Republic. Um, we're going to talk about a number of things, uh, but this is kind of our first, our first cut at the Republic. Um, and this, primarily what we'll be dealing with today is the question of justice, which arises in the Republic. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of context and then go into the substance of the text and we're going to analyze it um, in quite a bit of detail. Um, what we'll do today is I'll introduce the Republic, I'll provide some context, um, some things that might you might have glossed over in terms of your reading. They might not have seemed overly important, but they are actually um, pretty significant. We're going to examine this initial debate within the text about justice and then we're going to examine the attempts of um, Socrates and his uh, friends, I guess to a certain extent, his acquaintances, the people that he's having this debate with. Um, we're going to examine their attempts to define justice, both um, at the level of the city, right, which um, in this context, this is before you had the modern state, so the, the primary kind of unit of government, the primary set of institutions would have been the city-state. Um, but we'll also examine this in relation to the individual, and that's where we'll close and, and we'll pick up in the next lecture with um, with kind of the extension of, of justice and how to how to institutionalize justice within a society, uh, the construction of what they call the city and speech. So um, that might not seem like a lot, <laughs> um, but having read the Republic, having worked through those first um, handful of books of the Republic, you know that this is a, an incredibly rich uh, and, and deep debate that's occurring. And there's, there's, these aren't um, simple questions that they're grappling with. And there's kind of a lot of back and forth and a lot of um, philosophical questioning that's going on. So there's a lot of richness to this. So um, the Republic, just to say a little bit about the Republic, it, the Republic is a foundational work of Western political philosophy. I mean, it is incredibly, incredibly important. And I think I said at the close of the last lecture, you know, once you've read the Republic and once you've really grappled with the Republic, um, it starts to turn up in all sorts of other places. You start to see different things, uh, movies, um, other works of philosophy and theory, um, novels, pop culture, uh, little references, little nods to the Republic. And that speaks to how important a work the Republic is. Uh, it really, it, it turns up everywhere. And so once you've had this initial exposure, and that's all this, this course is designed to give you, is initial exposure. Uh, but once you have that, you begin to see this in plenty of other places. Um, the Republic asks a number of really important and enduring questions. Uh, if you think about our society today, if you think about contemporary American politics, contemporary American society, we have debates over what is just and what is justice all the time. Um, think of contemporary political issues. <clears throat> think of the debate over um, healthcare, right? That is a debate over whether or not people have uh, an obligation, a right to have, uh, you know, this basic healthcare provided for them by the state if they can't provide it for themselves. If you think of debates over um, taxes, right, and what one ought to contribute in terms of taxes, those are debates about justice as well. Um, so, you know, any political issue, any of the core contemporary political issues that really divide us, um, those are also debates about justice. And the fact that we continue to have these pitched debates about these issues shows us that we haven't really arrived at a single definition of what, what constitutes justice. Um, and, and we still haven't, right? Uh, the Republic, this is a debate that was occurring a couple thousand years ago. But even in contemporary society, we still have fundamental divides over what constitutes justice and what it means to be just. So um, this kind of goes back to Berlin. Uh, and he was talking about how political theory is this realm in which 
we ask questions that don't have uh, single answers, right? Uh, there are no uncontroversial single answers to what constitutes justice, what it means to be just. And we can see that in the fact that uh, this question is introduced in the Republic, but thousands of years later, we're still grappling with it. So the Republic is important in that it asks a number of important and enduring questions, and it really kind of sets the agenda, sets the framework for Western political theory and political thought moving forward. So obviously it asks the question of what is justice? It also asks the question, um, why be just? Is it better, is it more advantageous to be just or to be unjust, right? To not care about whether you're behaving justly and to simply uh, pursue your own self-interest at the expense of everyone around you. Uh, it also kind of scales those questions up to the level of society. So the Republic is also asking, how do we create the just society and potentially offering a blueprint, a framework for what the just society would look like? Uh, and it's asking also, what are the qualities of the just citizen? If you're going to be a part of this society, um, you know, how do you behave? What do you do? So, um, so that's, that's what we're dealing with in the Republic. And that's why it's so important because of, because of its subsequent impact on Western political thought, uh, a little bit of context. And, and this is interesting because, um, normally we, we kind of delve right into the substance of the Republic and we don't think about this kind of weird set of events that lead up to the dialogue, right? We focus simply on the dialogue, but we don't focus on what happens at the very, very outset of the Republic. But if you think back to that, um, those initial few pages, you know, what's happening there? Well, Socrates is returning home from a festival, actually a religious festival, uh, with a young friend named Glaucon, and um, they're confronted on the road by Adamantus and Polymarchus. And essentially they want Socrates to come with them to the house of, of Polymarchus. And that's it's owned by his, his aging father, whose name is Cephalus. Right? And um, they, they actually get Socrates to come back to the house. Um, he's kind of reluctant, but they get him, him to come back essentially by force, right? Um, you know, they basically say that we're younger and stronger, and so if you don't want any issues, you're going to come with us, which is kind of weird, right? Um, and, and once they're there, they, you know, once they get to Ceph the house of Cephalus, the home of Cephalus, um, they'll, they briefly start to talk about wisdom, and they're talking about one's age, right? But very soon, the subject matter turns to justice, and that sets in motion the rest of the dialogue that occurs in the Republic, um, so why is that important? What does that opening tell us about Athens, about Socrates, about the question of justice? Well, um, it, it's interesting because it kind of connects what goes on in the Republic to uh, the defense, which we've, which we've talked about in here. Um, first, there's a significance of Socrates being in the company of uh, primarily you know, young people. These are, these are young men that are going to engage in this discussion. So this charge that uh, Socrates faced, if you remember in the defense, he was supposedly corrupting the youth. Well, we see that here. Right? We see the, um, the interest that the young people have in talking to Socrates and hearing what this, this philosopher has to say. Um, and also what's interesting is that they can't simply have this conversation out in public. Right? It's very significant that they leave, um, essentially they're in the middle of you know, the road, but they, they leave this public place and they need to go to kind of a private location to have this conversation about justice. So we might think about why that is. Well, you know, on one level it's comfort. It's easier to go to somebody's house to have a long philosophical conversation than it is to stand in the middle of the road. But um, it also says something about the types of questions that they're asking and the type of dialogue that they're engaged in. They're dealing with controversial questions. They're dealing with questions 
that potentially put them in danger, right? They're talking about what? They're talking about justice, and not only justice, but the ideal form of justice. So if they're going to talk about the ideal form of justice, they essentially have to go someplace private to have that conversation. What does that tell us about Athens? Well, we already know that Socrates considers the existing Athenian society to be unjust and to be kind of corrupt. And so they have to go to a private place in order to have that conversation because questions about the ideal form of justice are always going to be threatening to the status quo in an unjust, imperfect society. Um, so, you know, particularly in a society that's become unjust and corrupt, those kinds of discussions are toxic. And so you need a realm in which you have the freedom to think, the freedom to explore new and unpopular ideas, and you're going to be somewhat protected. And at this time, there's no location for such debates to take place. Um, if you think about our contemporary society, uh, we do have a place in which those sorts of questions, those sorts of conversations, you can have them, right? Um, essentially, the academy, universities. So today, the designated place where we have these open-ended debates and conversations about principles of justice or our normative ideals, that happens largely in academic settings, right? And this is um, when we talk about academic freedom. This is what we mean, is the ability to explore controversial, potentially subversive ideas. But Socrates didn't have that in Athens. Um, there wasn't any such structure that was really a designated, protected realm for the advancement of knowledge. Uh, Plato, actually, after Socrates died, uh, he would go on to found such an institution. He founded something called the Academy. And the Academy operated for hundreds of years, and essentially it was really the first formal institution of higher education in Western civilization. But at the time of Socrates, no such structure existed. So essentially the institution in which um, we all sit today, the university, it was one that was really born out of uh, political repression and fear of the state. We needed some place where we could engage ideas for the sake of ideas, and we didn't have to worry about you know, becoming, well, essentially encountering the fate that Socrates would in the defense when uh, he was essentially put to death for asking controversial questions and questions which put him in danger. Okay. Um, so this is the subversive activity that they're gauged in. They're essentially theorizing about the ideal form of justice, but, but they can't do it in public. They have to go into private to do it. They need some place where they're going to be shielded from scrutiny, shielded from the state. Um, so, in cast of characters, um, primarily here we're talking about these, these six characters. Uh, you have Socrates, who you now know. He's really the protagonist. He's driving the conversation. You have Cephalus. Uh, the debate occurs within his home. He is uh, an elderly arms manufacturer. He makes weapons. He has done pretty well for himself, we gather, right? Um, and he kind of, he's really only involved in the first book, and then he disappears. You have uh, Thrasymachus, who's a, a really important character, but he, again, is involved early on, and he kind of disappears. And uh, he's, a, he's a sophist. He is one of these individuals who makes his money supposedly by being an expert and instructing people, acting as a tutor, training people in certain topics. Uh, you have Glaucon and Adamantus. They're both their brothers, they're sons of Ariston. And then you have Polymarchus, who is the son of Cephalus, the elderly arms manufacturer. Um, those six characters are the primary characters that we get exposed to in the Republic. There's also a number of um, silent characters. They never speak. We never hear from them. They never, one of them chimes in at one point and there's some reference to him, but for the most part, they're, they're silent. Uh, Lysias, Nicaratus, right? They're, they're listed in the dialogue as being there, but um, they're silent. They never speak. They never actually engage in the dialogue, which is, which is kind of strange, right? We might think about why even include those people in the list of characters uh, if they didn't speak up. 
Um, not really sure why that is, right? Um, but they're they're there, right? Um, so the question, as I said, uh, the kind of question that's driving the debate is what is justice? And we get exposed to some kind of crude definitions of justice early on in the Republic. And they kind of, they don't just dismiss them outright. That's not really the style of Socrates. Um, but they kind of bat them around philosophically. And, you know, someone will throw out a definition of justice and then they kind of pursue it for a little bit until they deem it to be deficient. So the first definition of justice that we get is from Cephalus. And that's really how the, the dialogue turns. They're talking to Cephalus, we're talking about how he's, you know, he's been very successful, he's very wealthy, we're talking about wisdom, they're talking about old age. And then the the question turns to justice and what it means to be just. And Cephalus offers up um, an answer to this. He offers up a uh, a definition of justice. And his definition of justice is uh, to speak the truth and to give back what one has taken from another. Right? Um, so, you know, we could look at that definition of justice. We can say, yeah, it's a pretty good definition of justice, right? Uh, we don't lie. We're not malicious in that sense that we, we disregard the truth. And there's also this notion of reciprocity. You know, if we have taken something from someone, uh, we're not going to hold it for our own. We're going to try and give back what we've taken from someone else. So um, they consider that for a little bit. And Socrates, he ultimately decides that this is deficient. Uh, this, is, this answer is could not be universally true in all cases. And that's really their criteria for what constitutes justice. Uh, if we're going to define justice... We need a definition of justice that's going to hold up in every case that we can say, yeah, in, in any instance, this is what it means to be just. And so Socrates finds this answer deficient. And he finds it deficient for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's not true in every case, right? Uh, the answer to the question of justice needs to have a universally applicable answer. And so he throws out this kind of hypothetical and he says, well, what if, you know, so returning what you've, what you've taken from someone, um, that, that is, if that's part of your definition of justice, what if you were, the thing that you were going to return would actually harm the individual who is the recipient, right? Um, so he uses this example, you know, imagine a friend who ha uh, has lend, lent you a weapon and, they come to you and they want that weapon back and they've lost possession of their senses, right? Uh, technically, by this definition of justice, you would have to give them back that weapon. But in so doing, you would give them the means to either harm themselves or potentially harm others, right? And we'd hesitate to call that a just act. We'd say, no, that's probably not a just act. Um, you could also, I mean, you could think of this just in, in really, um, you know, more contemporary terms. Uh, imagine you borrowed some money from a friend and that friend came looking for their money. And since they'd lent you the money, um, they had had some trouble in their life. And let's say they developed an addiction of some kind, right? They were drinking too much or using drugs or, you know, they were, a gambling addict or something like that. Um, technically, by this definition of justice, if you had the money and you could, you could give it back to them, then you had to you have to give it back to them. But you'd actually be doing them harm by doing that, right? Um, so that's <clears throat> that is the means by which he dismisses Cephalus and his his definition of justice. But the broader point, the more important point, is that they're looking for a definition of justice which is going to be universally applicable, right? It's going to be true in every case. Uh, and that's really what motivates the rest of their dialogue and their debate. Um, a second definition of justice we get from Polymarchus. And remember, Polymarchus is Cephalus, it's uh, the son of Cephalus. And so we get his definition of justice. And he defines justice as doing good to our friends and harm to our enemies. 
And so we see some similarities with Cephalus, which makes sense, right? He's, he's uh, Polymarchus is his son, after all. So he retains this notion of what we would call reciprocity. He retains this notion of giving each person his due or her due, right? Um, so there's some similarities there. And it sounds reasonable, right? That sounds like a reasonable definition of justice. But again, Socrates um, finds this answer deficient. He probes at it philosophically, and he examines it a bit more. And he says, no, this actually isn't a very good definition of justice. So why is it deficient? Well, one is human fallibility, right? He says, what if we misjudge our friends and our enemies? So what if we think someone is our friend and we do good things for them and they're actually out to get us? They're actually you know, out to harm us. Well, then that couldn't be justice. That couldn't be a definition of justice. And he also says it's logically inconsistent, right? Um, by this definition, we potentially harm others in the name of justice. We're doing harm to our enemies. And he says, think about that, right? When you're harming someone else, does your harm against them ever make them a better human being, ever make them more just? Does it ever kind of advance the cause of justice? And he says, no, it doesn't, right? Um, in fact, by harming others, we're actually more likely to make them even more unjust. We undermine the cause of justice by harming others. Um, so you could think uh, of example of the example of the American prison system. Right, uh, we have really, really high rates of of people. I think it's about seventy percent. Once you go into the prison system, you are much, much more likely to come out and commit crimes once again. And it's because. Many argue, right? Many critics of the prison system argue it's because the focus is on punishment. And when you punish people, um, you don't kind of, you don't turn people over to the cause of justice by punishing them. You actually make them uh, resentful. You exacerbate all sorts of psychological and emotional problems that they have, and they actually end up more unjust, right? So some people refer to the American prison system as essentially school for hardened criminals. You go there to learn how to be a more wicked, more conniving criminal. Um, and it looks like, judging on what he says here, Socrates would probably agree with that argument. So again, we have another definition of justice that's deemed to be inadequate, that's deemed to be deficient. And then we have Thrasymachus. Uh, Thrasymachus as I said, he's a sophist. Uh, he has a lot of problems with Socrates. Uh, and he's just kind of been sitting there as they have this debate. And um, he's been silent. He hasn't been weighing in. And he's kind of stewing in his own anger. And he basically um, explodes, right? <laughs> he's kind of fed up with this whole conversation that's occurring with regard to justice and he just kind of bounds out of his position and weighs in and he defines justice um, in this way he says justice is simply the interest of the stronger right and he's really dismissive of the debate that's been going on thus far they've been having this kind of philosophical debate throwing ideas back and forth complimenting each other on how brilliant one another is but he has no patience for this, right? He sees things very definitively, very dogmatically. And he says, justice is simply the interest of the stronger. You guys are hopelessly misguided if you think it's anything but that, right? Um, so when we look at that, when we look at that definition of justice, it's really, it's, if we go back to the criteria that they've laid out, which is a universally applicable definition of justice, when we look at this, this is not so much a definition of justice. He's not really trying to define justice because there's no content there. The content is whatever the strongest person in society says it's going to be. Um, so it's not so much a definition of justice, but basically it's a claim that justice lacks any solid foundation. Justice is simply what the powerful in society say justice is going to be. Um, a really controversial idea, but I think many people 
know, particularly jaded, cynical people, when they think about politics, they kind of accept that, right? They say, yeah, you know, basically, uh, government's out to screw you, they're out to enrich themselves, and w there's no real, you know, law and justice and the common good and the public good, all of that stuff is just kind of rhetoric. And really, um, people in power are out to define the rules of the game and define the rules of the game in a way that benefits them. And, you know, Socrates, he's careful in how he, <laughs> he answers Thrasymachus because he's really afraid that Thrasymachus might beat him up, right? He's so... Um, incredibly angry and forceful in his presentation of justice that Socrates is a little freaked out by him. But he says, no, this definition of justice is actually deficient as well. And so why is this definition of justice deficient? Well, um, again, there's the problem of human fallibility, right? What if the strong misjudge their own interests, which happens all the time, right? You do something, you think it's in your own interest, uh, whether you're, you know, a weak person within society or a strong person with a lot of political power, and you do something, you think it's in your own interest, but actually it isn't. You've chosen badly, right? That's the problem of human fallibility. Um, also, he says that really, if you think about any role in society, uh, it has to serve something beyond our own self-interest, right? Um, so any role in society doesn't simply serve its own interest, but it serves some larger interest. And he uses the example of a physician. If we think about a physician, um, he doesn't simply work to his own interest, but also that of his patients. So if your doctor, you know, if you went in... Um, complaining of, you know, a mild headache and it wouldn't go away and Tylenol wasn't working and you weren't sure what was happening. And that physician um, diagnosed you and attempted to treat you based solely on self-interest, let's say economic interest. He said, yeah, you know, I think you have this really complex problem and we're going to um, need to conduct this really sophisticated surgery that's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to make me a lot of money. Um, that wouldn't be a very good physician. He wouldn't survive as a physician for very long if he was simply using that role to benefit his or her own self-interest, right? Um, and the same is true of politics. No ruler, no political figure can simply advance only their own self-interest. Eventually, they have to at least pay lip service uh, and attempt to serve some sort of larger goal. Otherwise, their constituents, the people they represent, will rise up against them. So um, Thrasymachus, after this exchange, you know, he kind of disappears for um, the rest of the dialogue. We don't really see him again, but he's advanced this real fundamental critical challenge to the debate about justice that's occurring right here. And he really he kind of changes, shifts the argument. Um, so he's no longer advancing a definition of definition of justice, he's simply saying that it's self-defeating to behave justly. Right? He says here, uh, a just man everywhere has the worst of it uh, compared with an unjust man. So, you know, essentially he's saying, uh, nice guys finish last, right? If you're going to attempt to behave justly, you're just going to be manipulated and abused, and it's never going to work out in your own interest. You're just going to get screwed over again and again and again by attempting to adhere to a definition of justice. So um, Thrasymachus, he's resolute. He is adamant in thinking that one generally enjoys a happier lifestyle when you simply abandon the dictates of justice. And that's that shifts the argument. That kind of changes um, the debate a little bit. And so Socrates has to delve into this question of um, justice versus injustice. And ultimately, you know, if they're going to continue to have this conversation, if it even makes sense to have a conversation about justice, then he has to argue why one would behave justly um, rather than unjustly. So they've kind of they've taken this, this 
turn away from defining what justice means, and now they're talking about the dangers of injustice. Um, so what are the dangers of injustice, according to Socrates? Well, injustice undermines collective endeavors, right? Um, he says, if the working of injustice is to implant hatred wherever it exists, will not the presence of it, whether among free men or slaves, cause them to hate one another and to form parties and disable them from doing anything together? Uh, it means that we can't do anything if we simply behave unjustly and we simply behave according to our own <clears throat> self-interest. We can't do anything collectively because um, we'll begin to hate each other, we'll develop these rival factions, and eventually any sort of um, activity that would involve trust or working together, we won't be able to do it, right? He even talks about thieves, right? If you're uh, thinking about individuals involved in a bank heist or something, right? There has to be some minimal level of trust among those individuals if they're going to pull it off, because otherwise they simply won't be able to do it. So we talk about honor among thieves, right? Essentially, honor among thieves is this weird sense of justice, even among people that are committed to cre undertaking a criminal act. Right? Um, but beyond that, even beyond collective endeavors, he says injustice even undermines our individual endeavors. He says, think about the unjust individual. Um, they're really torn apart by inward strife and division. Um, so they, you know, even if they succeed at pulling off some sort of um, unjust action and they benefit from it in some sense, their gains can't be enjoyed because they have this conflicted internal state. If you think about unjust individuals, uh, oftentimes they're paranoid they're um you know can't trust even people who are close to them they're um kind of torn apart inside by this internal strife and so even if they manage to kind of pull off this unjust action they're not going to be able to enjoy it and ultimately he says that's what prevents the unjust man from enjoying happiness in the same way that the just man does he can't achieve anything so justice is what enables us to do things in collaboration with one another, but also to live a life free of internal strife, right? Free of this kind of conflicted sense of self. Um, so at the end of book one, it almost appears as if Socrates has wrapped things up. Um, they haven't actually defined justice, but as far as the point that Thrasymachus makes regarding injustice being superior to justice, it seems like they've reached a conclusion, uh, but they're actually, they're not, they're not done yet. Um, and they move on to the intrinsic value of justice. Um, so what do they mean by the intrinsic value of justice? Well, Glaucon, he's still kind of unconvinced at the start of book two. Um, and he says to Socrates, uh, do you wish really to convince us that it is on every account better to be just uh, than to be unjust, or only to seem to have convinced us, right? So he's not completely done yet. Um, and Glaucon, he then introduces what he calls the three classes of things, right? So there are um, things that we value both intrinsically, so meaning for its own sake, and uh, due to their consequences, we could talk about... Um, intelligence, we could talk about sight, we could talk about health, right? Uh, we like, um, you know, maybe you, you really like um, running, you know, you enjoy getting out and running or hiking or engaging in some sort of physical activity. Um, you, you find it rewarding, those endorphins get flowing, you feel good. Um, but it's also, it has, you know, a, a good outcome and that you're ultimately more healthy for doing that. Right? That would be something that we value both intrinsically and for its consequences. He says, the second class of things are those things which we value uh, only intrinsically. So they have no real consequences. These are um, simple pleasures. Think of like frivolous hobbies, right? Uh, say you really enjoy collecting 
I don't know, stamps or something. Um, you aren't doing it to make money. You're not doing it because they're valuable or they're going to be worth something. There's no kind of, you know, motive in terms of, uh, becoming rich off of this, but you just enjoy the activity for the sake of the activity. It's a simple pleasure. You, um, you, you enjoy it on that sense only. <clears throat> Those would be, um, the things that we value only intrinsically. And then the last category category are those things which have intrinsic value, but also important consequences. So, um, or I'm sorry, the things which have no intrinsic value, but important consequences. Um, so the dentist, going to the dentist, right? Uh, unless you're a masochist and you enjoy pain, right? Nobody enjoys having a root canal. Um, but it's really important to do, right? You have to do that for its consequences. You may put it off, you may avoid it, you may not go for your checkup because you know you might have a cavity, but eventually um, that kind of weighs on you. You know that there's going to be really negative consequences if you let that go much longer, and so you go and you do it, but you do it simply for its consequences. You know you're not going to enjoy it, right? And so Glaucon introduces these three categories and he says, what is justice in relation to these three? And Socrates says, well, it's number one. You know, we get intrinsic value out of uh, being just and um, we uh, do it also for its consequences. <clears throat> we enjoy the consequences of being uh, a just individual as well. And Glaucon says, well, no, probably not. You're probably wrong, Socrates. And he might be playing the devil's advocate here, right? He might be, um, you know, he might really agree with Socrates, but he wants to see Socrates kind of work out his philosophical justification for this. So he says, no, you're wrong. Um, actually, most people probably regard it as number three. They see it as having no intrinsic value, but perhaps important consequences. Um... So Glaucon says to Socrates, he says, your opinion is not that of the many by whom justice is ranked in the irksome class as a thing in itself and for its own sake is, um, as a thing which in itself and for its own sake is disagreeable and repulsive, but which it is well to practice for the advantages to be had from it with an eye to rewards and good name, right? So Glaucon is saying essentially that we act justly, we act according to justice, uh, one, because we care about our reputation, and two, because no one wants to live in a lawless society, right? Um, I might want to steal your cell phone from you because it looks really neat and I want a new cell phone, but I don't want to live in a society where it becomes the norm that if you want something, from someone else, you can just take it because that might come back to bite me, right? Uh, and I also care about my reputation. I don't want to get a reputation as a cell phone thief, so I don't do that, right? Um, but I don't get any intrinsic value from that. In fact, you know, I still really want your cell phone. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to steal your cell phone. Um, and Glaucon's saying essentially that's how most people view justice as this kind of necessary evil, uh, and they don't get any intrinsic enjoyment from it. And he says, you know, ultimately, this is why we need punishment. This is why we need compulsion. He says, none are just willingly, but only by compulsion, because to be just is not a good to the individual, for all violate justice whenever they imagine there is nothing to hinder them, right? So say, um, you know, I'm at a train station and there's no one else around. It's completely deserted. And I go and I sit down on the bench and I see this unattended cell phone that looks really, really neat uh, sitting next to me. And I think I might be able to, you know, get that cell phone and use it. And no one will ever know. I won't be caught. There's no cameras around. He said, then, you know, I might engage in that unjust action if I think that there's nothing to hinder me. Now, a cell phone might be a bad example because you can trace it and track it. Um, but, you know, maybe it's just a $20 bill 
we find lying on the street. Um, I'm, you know, probably just going to pocket that if it doesn't look like I'm going to get caught uh, because there's no, there's nothing to hinder me. There's no threat of punishment or compulsion. Um, so Glaucon says we need to ultimately compel people to act justly because they get no intrinsic benefit from, from doing so. And they view the burdens of acting just, justly as just that, burdens, right? We have to force them to behave that way. Um, so again, another challenge to the idea that people behave justly, that people have this kind of good, intrinsic, just nature about themselves. So at this point, um, Adamantus steps up and he says, look, Socrates, um, what you ultimately have to show us is not only the good consequences, but the intrinsic benefit of justice. And so that's where they end up at the end of book two. Socrates now has to show the intrinsic benefit of justice, um, the value of justice, even if we didn't take into account the consequences for our reputation or for the society in which we live. And Socrates says to do that, right, we have to maybe think about justice within the city itself. We are more likely to find justice um, in larger proportions there. It might be easier to discover if we think about the city. Right? So that's um, ultimately where they turn next. Um, so at the end of book two, um, let me pop back for a second. At the end of book two, um, Socrates now has to show the intrinsic benefit of justice. So why we act justly, not simply for its own sake, but, um, or why we act justly simply for its own sake, but not due to compulsion or fear or threat or punishment, right? So that's a pretty tall order. And so he argues that in order to do this, we should turn to justice within the city. And um, Socrates has to prove that there really is something naturally rewarding about behaving justly. But he needs to define justice in order to do so. They still haven't defined justice here. Um, so he says in order to do that, we need to look at the city. We need to look at how the city is organized and potentially the interrelationships between different societal roles, what that means in relation to justice. Okay. So um, that's where they turn next. So, um, so they start talking about the organization of the city. Right. And in order to do that, they have to talk about what types of different individuals reside within the city. Right. What are the different uh, kind of classes of individuals that reside within the city? And um, they come up with these categories of individuals who reside within the city. Um, first is the rulers. Right. There have to be people in charge. Um, and he kind of even lays out the qualities that these individuals would have to have. He says the rulers have to have uh, inward conviction. They have to do what they always feel to be right for the city. They have to have intelligence. They have to have power. They have to care for the city. They say He says that generally they must be old, right? The old must rule over the young. They have more experience. They have... Um, perhaps stronger convictions, uh, they're wiser, right? Um, they also must have a tenacious memory of their commitment to the city, so they won't be easily corrupted, so they won't use their position of power for uh, personal gain. And um, also we have to subject these individuals to a series of tests and trials to make sure that they're unacceptable to trickery, that they won't kind of fall victim to... Um, the people that will try and corrupt them and, and manipulate them. Um, in addition to that, we have guardians um, and auxiliaries, right? And basically their job is um, security. They're there to protect the city, to guard against uh, attack from outside, to guard against internal lawlessness, right? That's what the the auxiliary class exists to do. And then lastly, we have um, pretty much everybody else, the craftsmen, the artisans, the farmers, the workmen, the merchants, 
Um, these people are going to make the products, make the things that the city needs. They're going to buy and sell those things. They're going to produce its food, produce its craft works, right? Um, obviously, this implies kind of a hierarchy. The rulers are probably going to be the smallest in number. The guardians and auxiliaries will be slightly larger, right? But by far the largest class is going to be these individuals um, who fulfill all the other roles, right? Who, who fulfill all of the um, kind of day-to-day, -day, more mundane activities associated with the city, associated with the society. So by its very nature, this implies a hierarchy. Um, if we would map this out, we would, you know, you could probably think of it as a, a pyramid, right? There would be this small little elite group of rulers, and then it would gradually get wider as we moved further down this social hierarchy. Um, so the problem is people tend to dislike inequality and hierarchy, right? If you reside at the bottom of a social hierarchy, you might resent that inequality. You might resent the fact that you are, you know, a, a fruit merchant and you're never going to be anything more than a fruit merchant while someone else has either military power or political power while these other classes rule above you, right? Um, so the rulers are going to rule, the auxiliaries are going to protect, but then you have this big class of individuals who are going to be kind of limited in their, um, in their power. And you have to kind of find a way to make that inequality and that hierarchy uh, less controversial. You have to find a way to naturalize that, um, that hierarchy, that inequality. And Socrates, you know, now he's talking kind of hypothetically about how if you wanted to create the just society, how would you do that? And uh, he comes up with this, this idea that essentially it serves as the social foundation for this society. And it's um, this very famous idea called the noble lie. And sometimes it's also called the myth of the metals, right? Um, so what does Socrates say here? Uh, he says, and keep in mind, this is what we're going to tell the people. This is not necessarily what Socrates believes. Um, this is essentially, a, it's a myth. It's a lie, right? We recognize it as such. Um, but we're going to say to the people, primarily the people in the lower classes, primarily the people that are not in a position to, to, um, to ever achieve either auxiliary or, or ruler status, we're going to tell them that the God who created you uh, mixed in the composition of such of you as are qualified to rule, uh, mixed gold in the composition of such of you as are qualified to rule, which gives them the highest, highest value. While in the auxiliaries, he made silver an ingredient, assigning iron and bronze to the cultivators of the soil and other workmen, right? Um, what does that mean? Well, the idea is, um, and again, this is a lie. It's a myth that we're telling people. But the idea is that there are different quality metals mixed into us, and they correspond to our ideal role within society, right? Um, they're kind of mixed with our soul in a certain way that f essentially determine where we're going to fit within this unequal hierarchy, this, this pyramid-like structure that makes up society. Um, and he goes beyond that to say that... Uh, this tends to be transmitted. Well, this is what we're going to tell them anyway. This tends to be transmitted from parent to child. Um, so essentially the composition of the soul, whether you have um, gold or silver or iron and bronze mixed in your soul, um, that's largely dependent on who your parents are. 
So if you're the child of a blacksmith, if you're the child of a farmer, it's fairly unlikely that you're going to become the ruler of this society. And he says there might be a situation, maybe, where, um, you know, we recognize in childhood that somebody is really exceptional and maybe they transcend their class, their category. But for the most part, these are going to be pretty rigid social roles and there's not going to be a lot of social mobility here. Okay. Um, and that is the myth which is supposed to create a foundation for our society. It's supposed to naturalize that inequality and that hierarchy. And just in case that wasn't enough, right? just in case it isn't enough to claim that there is this rigid social hierarchy, um, Socrates says there needs, there needs to be an element of fear as well. So he says, um, there is an oracle which declares that the city shall perish when it is guarded by iron or bronze. Right. So if those individuals at the bottom of the social hierarchy try and rise up and achieve either positions as rulers or they try and take up arms and protect the society, then the city shall perish. So remember that oracles in ancient Greece, they're, um, they're viewed as sources of divine wisdom. So not only if you try and transcend that hierarchy, are you, uh, you know, kind of stepping out of line, but you're actually disobeying divine wisdom, right? So there's this element of fear. There's this element of um, punishment that we see within the myth of the metals and it's on that basis it's on the basis of thinking <laughs> i know we've finally gotten to the question of defining justice within society but it's on that basis of society being organized into these different roles that leads us to the first definition of justice that all of the uh, individuals involved in this conversation are willing to accept right um, and it's a very simple definition of justice. Uh, justice is defined as to have and do what belongs to us and is our own. And injustice is any intermeddling in the three parts. So we're talking about the three parts that make up society. Um, any intermeddling in the three parts or change from one to another, uh, this would inflict great damage on the city and may with perfect pr propriety be described in the strongest sense as doing harm. Right? So um, what does that mean? And is that a definition of justice that we're comfortable with? Well, um, essentially, if you think about that, what that means is we're defining justice as kind of knowing your role within larger society, knowing where you fit within that social hierarchy and not stepping outside it, uh, not trying to transcend it or change it or alter the, the basic landscape of social relations within your society. So, you know, to, to be born a blacksmith is to accept that you are a blacksmith, you are probably predetermined to be a blacksmith, and you're only ever going to be a blacksmith and not be anything else. And um, your children are probably going to be, you know, within that iron and bronze class, doing something on the lower register of society with very little political power. Um, knowing your role, performing your role, performing your obligations to the state and to society, that is the definition of justice. That might not be a definition of justice that uh, a lot of you are comfortable with, right? Because especially as Americans, we value things like individual freedom. We value things like social mobility. Um, the whole notion of the American dream is this notion that we can transcend our lot. We can transcend the position into which we're born and become anything that we want to be, right? And this is a definition of justice that really conflicts with that. It's a very different conception, I think, of what it means to be just and what justice within the society means, okay? Um, now, on that basis, so they've defined justice within the city, but now they get down to the business of 
um, defining the just individual. And this is um, kind of where we wrap up today. But um, the whole purpose of describing the just society, remember this, was uh, we did that in order to get back to the individual, in order to understand the just individual. So he says, uh, Socrates says, a man is just in the same way in which we have found the city to be just. And they've talked about the um, categorization of social roles and people within the city. But they say now that just as the city is organized into three different types of people, also the human soul is, uh, consists of three parts, is comprised of these three different parts. So what are the three parts of the human soul? Um, and we call this <clears throat> the tri tripartite division of the soul. Uh, it's a really famous idea from the Republic, and lots of people refer to it. Tripartite just meaning, you know, tri and part. Uh, your soul is comprised of, of three parts. The individual is comprised of these three different uh, fundamental dimensions of their their existence um, so what are the three parts well, the first is is logos what we call logos um, that is rationality right that's essentially what that translates as um, this is the part of the soul that reasons it engages in the search for truth it engages in the search for wisdom right that's one part of your soul um, the second part of your soul is eros, which basically um, translates as appetite. But, you know, appetite in terms of um, sensual pleasures, the word erotic, right, which we often use in reference to sex, which is a form of sensual pleasure, um, that gets its, its root is the word eros, which refers to our sensual appetites. So eros is the part of the soul which hungers and thirsts and it seeks pleasure and indulgence and fulfills fundamental desires, right? And it's important. You need that. Uh, if you didn't hunger and thirst, then, you know, you would, you would die, right? Or you would be malnourished. You wouldn't be able to survive. So it's another important part of the human soul. Um, and then we have thumos. And thumos, um, it's, you know, this is kind of a weird word. It doesn't translate perfectly. Um, some people try and translate it as spirit, but it's really, it's more than that. It's uh, spiritedness is more what thumos refers to. But um, thumos is really the part of the soul that excites us, that motivates us. It determines the intensity with which we seek um, either reason <clears throat> or our, our appetites. You think of, um, I don't know, think of patriotism. Think of somebody that gets really amped up on the 4th of July and, and really into how much they love America. Or think of, um, you know, your uh, school spirit, right? If you really love your school and your sports teams, then you have this, you kind of, you know, overwhelming desire to see your team succeed and you um, immediately kind of uh, disregard or even vilify other, other teams and other um, universities. Um, so, you know, Thumas is, refers to that spiritedness. It's this um, part of the soul when we're, we're really excited, right? And we're really amped up. That's what Thumos refers to. Um, and so those different qualities of the soul, um, basically justice um, is about balance. If we think about what made the city just, and right, if we go back to the society as a whole, justice was defined as balance. It was defined as, uh, let me actually quote this here, going back to our definition of justice, but uh, justice was oop, um, 
Oh, here we go. Um, so justice was to have and do what belongs to us and is our own, right? And we talked about that within the context of the social hierarchy of the city. That meant essentially not upsetting that social hierarchy. Um, it's kind of going to work out the same way within the individual, right? So in the city, justice was really, it was each member doing his part and not questioning the larger balance between the different components of the city. And Socrates sees the individual human in the same way. Um, so justice within the individual is really, it's about a balance. It's a proper balance between these different aspects of uh, his or her soul. Your, your logos, your eros, and your thumos, your reason, your appetite, and your spiritedness. Um, so, uh, what makes the individual just then is the inward parts of the soul doing their proper work in a kind of harmony, right? And no one part completely dominating the soul and not allowing the others to function. So justice within, within the individual is about balance. Uh, Socrates says, the just man will not permit the several principles within his soul to interfere with each other, but will really set his house in order. Having gained a mastery over himself, will still regulate his character as to be on good terms with himself and to set those principles in tune together. And the reverse of justice then within the individual is, um, is simply an imbalance. It says that injustice is really a state of strife between the three principles. Um, oops. Uh, Yep, a state of strife between the three principles and the disposition to meddle and interfere and the insurrection of a part of the soul against the whole. This past aspiring to supreme, uh, this part aspiring to supreme power within the soul to which it has no right, right? Um, so think about any one of those, those three parts of the soul. Um, I'll shoot back here. So we can see them again. Logos, eros, thumos, right? Um, eros, if we imagine kind of the, the um, appetites of your soul dominating your, your being, right? Uh, we can think about plenty of people. We could think about alcoholics. We could think about people who um, compulsively engage in like binge eating, right? And they just love food and eat food and are unhealthy and ultimately miserable because of it, right? Um, those would be individuals whose soul is out of balance. And as a result, those are the types of individuals who um, often become unjust, right? Same with uh, thumos. If you're completely dominated by thumos, um, then you kind of engage in, I don't know, these irrational bursts of anger, uh, excitement, you uh, are unable to think rationally because your thumos is so dominant, right? Um, so those are individuals who are not kind of well primed to be just individuals. They'll likely be unjust. And it's because of this imbalance in their soul. Okay. And then, so justice is a form of balance. And then this gets us to um, the tripartite division of the soul. Uh, this is just a demonstration of kind of what this sense of balance means, right? We have our reason, we have our spirit or spiritedness, we have our appetite. And the idea is that all of these things in relation to one another are supposed to be moderating one another. No one single aspect of the soul is supposed to be um, dominant is supposed to be ruling over all the others, okay? Um, and now the issue is to uh, connect it, right? Is to kind of tie it all together. And there is a correspondence between uh, the aspect of the soul, which is going to need to be more developed and more refined, right? Not necessarily dominant, because that would be an unjust individual, but these different categories within society, these different categories in the social hierarchy, the rulers, the craftsmen, the auxiliaries, um, 
each one is going to have to attend to the specific aspect of their soul that is going to make them able to excel in terms of fulfilling that, that role that they play within society. Um, and Socrates lays this out. He says, okay, the rulers, let's go back to that class of rulers. Which aspect of their soul are they really going to have to attend to? Well, it's going to be their logos. It's going to be their rationality. And why is that? Well, these are the only individuals within the entire society whose job it is to reason for the good of that society. So they have to really have this well-developed sense of logos and their education and their training is going to have to focus on the development of their logos. These are going to have to be brilliant individuals who know how to exercise their rationality in really um, creative and fundamental ways. Okay. Um, what about the craftsmen, the farmers? Um, that whole category of artisans and workers that are going to be the most numerous within society. Well, they have to focus on uh, arrows, their appetites, right? Well, why is that? Um, well, these are the individuals who make things. Uh, they grow our food. They kind of make our products. Um, they, they make everything that we use. And so for them to be able to fulfill their role within society, they need to have these cultivated tastes and sensibilities um, in order to appreciate beauty, in order to appreciate taste, in order to appreciate these things that you know, they need to know how to identify, yet they also have to know how to control those impulses. Eros is a, a dangerous aspect of the soul. It's very easy for Eros to kind of um, become an obsession, become a compulsion. And so they have to be able to not only appreciate goodness and taste and beauty and sensual pleasure, but also to control it. Right? And thumos. Um, well, if we if we think about the auxiliaries and the guardians, the last social category, um, their training, their education, what they're going to have to focus on refining and developing is their thumos. And why is that? Because these are the individuals who ultimately have to protect society. So, you know, if you think of a soldier on the battlefield, um, they have to have that ability to put themselves in harm's way, to confront enemies, to confront adversaries that want to kill them and want to hurt them uh, and, and continue to just kind of charge at them, right, and to uh, defeat them and to protect the society as a whole, and to protect society in situations in which they're going to be put into danger. Right? So their thumos, their spiritedness, is what they have to refine in order to be able to uh, fulfill that role. With all of these, right? again, I think it's important to stress, with all of these, um, Socrates is not saying that, well, in the rulers, their rationality, their logos should be dominant. Because remember, the very definition of injustice is when someone's soul is out of balance. So if you're allowing any part of your soul to dominate, right, then you are an unjust individual. You're, you do not have the balance required to be a just individual. So um, all he's saying, his only argument, is that these qualities need to be more refined, right? Um... I know that's, I know that's a lot, and we went through a lot today. But that's um, basically this opening discussion that they've had about justice, and that's the beginning of their uh, discussion of justice, both at the level of society, which is really where they start, and the individual. Okay, um, so hopefully that's that's clear. If it's not, uh, if any aspect of it's unclear, or any other, any aspect of that. The explanation of what's going on within the Republic is unclear. Um, please don't hesitate to be in touch with me. We can talk about it during the virtual office hours. Um, for next time, uh, obviously you have uh, reading to do for next time. There's also a video clip uh, associated with today's lecture. I think it's interesting to think about the way that Socrates defines uh, justice in relation to the ways that we think about American citizenship. I said, you know, when we were talking about the definition of justice uh, that, that Socrates defines as basically being one in which you don't 
question your role within society, that might seem kind of alien to us as Americans because we're, you know, the American political ethos is a very individualistic one and we pride ourselves on social mobility and, you know, being able to do whatever you want and not being constrained by uh, a social hierarchy. Um, but yet at the same time, I think we do have elements of this uh, within American citizenship and within the way that we think about our role within American society. So today's clip, it's actually um, from 1955. It's a an old, um, basically you have to call it a, a propaganda film. I mean, it was produced during the height of the Cold War. Uh, it was talking about the virtues of American citizenship, the responsibilities of American ci citizenship. And it was doing so in relation to, you know, the Soviet Union, communism, all the things that we feared in the United States in the 1950s. But um, I want you to watch this clip and think about uh, whether or not we in the United States have these sharply delineated roles to play within society. Is there uh, a social hierarchy within our society, even if we don't want to admit it? And does this definition of justice that we encounter within the Republic capture anything? within our own society. Um, so hopefully you find it interesting. I know it might be a little bit uh, dated at this point. Maybe, you know, maybe you watch it and you say, yeah, that might have made sense in the 1950s, but it's uh, we, we've come a long way in the past 60 years or so. And so this isn't entirely accurate anymore. Um, but think about it. And I'd be interested to see your thoughts on the discussion board. For... Next time, we are uh, finishing up with The Republic, where you're reading books uh, five through seven, and then uh, book nine. Book nine is the excerpt that you have is fairly short. It's basically just a recap of their definition of justice after they've explored these other ideas. Um, what they'll start to talk about in this section is how the just society will be set up in terms of its institutions, its practices, who ought to rule, uh, how you create this just society in which you have um, people who are able to perform these different social roles and perform them well. So, um, so it's it's really interesting, and I think you'll probably see some things that strike you as incredibly progressive and forward thinking for the time. You'll probably see some other things that sound um, terrible. You know, sound completely like a, a dystopia of some kind. It's a really interesting section. And this is also the section in which you encounter <clears throat> um, the allegory of the cave, which is uh, this allegory, it's this metaphor used to uh, describe an unjust society and, and what it's like to live within an unjust society. And it's it's one of these ideas, one of these philosophical constructs that, that turns up and, and comes up everywhere. Uh, so that's what we'll be talking about uh, next time. And as I said, the video clip, uh, Responsibilities of American Citizenship is up on online and you can participate in the discussion board. So we'll stop there for today and uh, pick it up with the next lecture. Thanks.